All right, let's uh, do some chemistry. Hopefully that doesn't disappear. All right, here's what we learned in the first of the slides. We learned that a chemical bond is an attraction that holds two atoms together and that it takes energy to break a chemical bond. And the two main types of bonds, well, first of all, we asked, why does this happen? And hopefully at this point of the course, you've come to realize that one, you can always say because it's stable, because that's often the reason why things happen. The other thing you can say is that everything wants to be like a noble gas and that things are bonding to be like a noble gas, which are stable electron configurations where their S and P orbitals are all full. And that's a total of eight electrons. And they achieve this by either the ionic way, they become ions, they become <laughs> ions, they become ions, and they either lose electrons like metals, which makes metals positive, or they gain electrons like nonmetals, and they become negative. Or they will start sharing electrons. I don't love that word sharing, but it is pretty much used in any scientific test about chemistry and covalent bonding. So sharing electrons is more covalent. So we're talking about the valence electrons here, the things on the outermost shell. Valence electrons are only the S and P, and they can only be a maximum of eight then. And the reason for that is this is the energy level, right? We talked about this on the periodic table. And the S and the P are always what row you're in or what energy level you're in, whereas the D and the F go below the row you're in. So if you're in row four, so energy level four, the S go in energy level four, but the D go in energy level three. And if you're in row six, the S go in energy level six, the D go in energy level five, and the F go in energy level four. So the F and D do not count toward valence electrons. That's a subtle point. Anyway, on with the Death Fighter. Death Fighter has Boo Boo Jeffries, and Boo Boo Jeffries hates fighting, whereas Gorbanox loves fighting. And the point of this is electronegativities, which are uh, a measure of the atom's ability to attract electrons. Every atom is sort of ranked like they are in those video games. And the higher the ranking, the more likely they are to fight. So you can see here that the Boo Boo Jeffries side of things are down here and the Scorpionox side of things are up here. And that becomes significant in this unit because, uh, why did I go here next? Anyway, all right. So we'll talk about why that's significant in a minute. Metals will lose electron to achieve noble gas configuration. And the point of this is these electron losing metals don't lose all their electrons. They only lose the outermost electrons because by losing, here's potassium, which has one outermost electron, one valence electron. And when that disappears, now it's valence electrons are the ones from the energy level before and that is already full so you can't steal one of these electrons from potassium you can only steal the outermost electron um, when it has just the one out there and that's because it's also shielded by all these electrons from the nucleus there's lots of reasons here but the point is metals will lose their valence electrons when i say that metals won't fight for electrons it's just the valence electrons that they have keeping them from having a noble gas configuration. So here's magnesium. Magnesium has two valence electrons. And when those disappear, now it has eight valence electrons in the energy level below it. So the point of all this is that metals will lose electrons uh, pretty easily, but then there's a point where you can't take it from a metal anymore. And it's just when it achieves that noble gas configuration. And also to let you know that metals are gaining some benefit by losing these electrons. They're getting noble gassy. Nonmetals will gain electrons also to achieve this noble gas configuration. So fluorine has seven valence electrons. When it picks up one from a metal or something, it will then have eight. And that's what it's trying to do. Oxygen has six, one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons. It needs two more. So it'll bond or... Uh, it'll ionically or covalently do what it needs to do to get those two electrons to have a complete outer shell. All right, so the difference in electronegativity will tell you what happens. If there's a huge difference, then that's an ionic uh, bond that will occur. So if the fighting difference between the two atoms involved is large, then that'll be an ionic compound. And if the fighting difference between the two atoms is small, they're typically going to be both high. That'll be considered a covalent bond. 
So ionic bonds are a hostile takeover. You're talking about two atoms who have a large difference in electronegativity. So there's one who really wants to pull an electron away and another one that doesn't really want to fight for it. So sodium is an example here of one that doesn't want to fight for it. It's a metal. It only has one valence electron. Losing it will give it the 10 of a noble gas. So there is a benefit to losing one electron. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. By picking up one, it'll have eight. So therefore, they both now have the valence electrons that they want as a noble gas. And now because it's positive and negative, they'll attract each other like magnets. All right. Covalent bonding, on the other hand, is sharing of electrons. So here, chlorine has seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, and one of these is chlorine's hydrogen has one. And by sharing these, hydrogen now thinks it has two, which is what helium has its noble gas, and chlorine thinks it has eight. So that's argon E is what chlorine thinks. We will represent the two shared electrons with a little dash sign like a bond like that and then notice chlorine has these lone pair around we call those lone pair because they're not involved in the bond but they are still pairs of electrons that influence things all right so another thing yeah don't worry about that uh, don't think we're gonna worry about that right yet let's not worry about that I've tried to talk to you about that but um, when we're talking about the difference in electronegativities, I will give you a chart similar to this. And so if I'm saying, all right, oxygen is going to be in a fight with copper and who gets the electrons and what happens? Well, oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5 and copper 1.9. So the difference between those two is 1.6. 1 1.6. Is that true? Yeah, it is 1.6. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Anyway, so... Oh, yeah, that is actually a thing. All right, so 1.6 sort of falls here in this polar region, right? So it's the difference between the electronegativities. So it's almost ionic, but not quite. Uh, if it's between 0 and 0 0.4, the difference between these two, so something like uh, uh, bromine and chlorine bonding with each other, two nonmetals, the difference is 0.2. So that would be considered a nonpolar covalent bond. Should always recognize CH as a nonpolar covalent bond. So whenever a carbon and a hydrogen get together, boy, I really don't know which way to go on this, carbon 2.5, hydrogen 2.1, those are considered a nonpolar uh, bond, it's the CH bond. So basically, if you remember this, specifically I would say 0.4 and 1.8, because then you can remember everything in between is polar. Um, 0 and 0.4 would be nonpolar, so sharing quite equally. 0.5 to 1.7 would be considered a polar bond, so almost being ionic, and ionic would be 1.8 or higher. So basically, this is explaining how there is a spectrum of bonding that you can either bond by sharing very nicely, right? You can either share very nicely in a nonpolar fashion. Here's a tug of war going on, and this is very equal between these grown up. Uh, influences on this kid and these childish influences on this kid. So when atoms pull evenly, we call that nonpolar. They would have close electronegativities. Polar is where one thing would be winning the sharing, but they're still sh quote unquote sharing. Uh, so atoms are pulling unevenly on common electrons. So the one that has more electronegativity is pulling a little more than the one that doesn't. And so I offered as an option to think about this, if I share a pizza with my daughter, that would be a polar situation where I'm eating more pizza than she is. Whereas if my daughter or if my sons are eating, sharing a pizza, both of them would kind of share it equally, if that makes some sense. Um, yes, this is not fair. All right. Um, let me show you these because I wish I could show you these. I used to make people do this. All right, so ionic bonding. Here's what happens. If we have two leg charges, two negatives here, you see as I try to chase that one, it's running away. So not much unlike when I try to kiss my daughter goodnight, she runs away and goes to bed. So that is what happens when like things happen. But when opposites happen, you will see here that there becomes an attraction like that. And then it gets more and more. And all of a sudden, they get drawn together and stuck and you can't 
really, right? Now they can't really pull them apart. So this is what an ionic bond does. When it has like, uh, when they're opposites, they attract each other sort of like magnets. All right. So we're talking about things of metals and things on the non-metal side of the staircase. Uh, here is sodium and chlorine. Sodium loses that electron to chlorine. And in the process, let's take that look at that again. Sodium gets a little smaller. Chlorine gets a little bigger because now chlorine has its noble gas configuration. Sodium has its noble gas configuration, but it has more protons to pull those electrons in. Chlorine has fewer protons to pull in 18 electrons. So that's why it gets a little bigger. But now they have this charge difference. And what we just learned on that previous graphic is now that they're charged, they attract each other. And part of that deal is, so here's actually chlorine exists as a diatomic molecule. We'll talk about that soon. That's sort of what happens. And then they line up so that the positives and negatives are all squared away. And then they start making that lattice. And here's the lattice. All right. So I will highlight this on the thing. But uh, I'll show you in a minute what this has to happen. All right. So here is covalent bonding. So the sharing. What's happening here is here's a hydrogen atom. It's nucleus with one electron. It's nucleus with another. And as you bring them closer together, there comes a point where they get stuck together. And if you look at the slow motion instant replay of this, here is a line representing the attraction of that electron to the nucleus. And as you bring them together, that nucleus is all of a sudden like, hey, there's another electron. And it starts attracting that. You see that very faint line. And then because of that, it draws that atom closer. And it's trying now to attract both electrons, as is the other nucleus. So now it looks like they're holding hands, but basically they're just in a tug of war over those electrons, and that's what keeps them together. Notice here also that the hydrogen on this side has no electrons. The hydrogen on this side has no electrons. That'll become important later. And now I can't pull them apart. Is that even a thing? No. All right. So they are drawn to each other because of their attraction for those electrons, and this will happen on non-metal side of things. So two non-metals who want electrons a lot. And this is an interesting thing here too. So there's a point where there's an attraction and the energy starts going down, 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 down. And then there's a point where the energy sort of hits the bottom. And to get any closer, the energy goes up. And the reason the energy is going up is because now the nuclei, the two positive nuclei, start repelling each other. So the nuclei don't want the little blue things, don't want to be close to each other. So they back off. But then there's sort of a sweet spot where the attraction for the electrons is, is good and the repulsion of the nuclei is not good. Many of you did not have to literally listen to what I just said there. All right, and that is the end of that. So the last thing we did was metallic bonding. And metallic bonding, since metals don't really care about their outermost electrons, so here's a bunch of metal atoms. They have one electron or two electrons floating around that they don't really care about. That electron sort of pass along and allow these metals to stick together. So these electrons just sort of float around. And this is actually also why metals are um, conductors of electricity. That's why we use metals in our wires. So think about it. If I'm a battery and I push an electron here, this metal will just sort of be like, all right, and then it will push that electron over there and that electron. And on the other side, an electron will pop out and go to the light bulb or whatever it is you want. So wires and metals conduct electricity because Electricity being a transfer of electrons can happen pretty easily within a metal where it doesn't really care about its electrons. So we did a thing in class where we had fake snowballs. And I was like, look, if I covered the floor in these fake snowballs, you would throw one and figure another one will come back to you sooner or later. Or if you're in a pool where they're giving you a floaty, you know, you'll take the floaty off and let it float away because you don't really care. There will be another one that comes around when you need it. So the snowballs, the floaties... That's what metallic bonding is like. All right. Thanks for listening. That went a little long. It's not my favorite one, but it's not awful.